Great. Thanks so much, Casey. And I'll echo uh, what Casey had said, which is thanking everybody for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, you know, the topic that I'm covering here is not a typical one uh, that most people may cover, but you know, I think that the planning for after surgery is just as important as the planning for before surgery and educating people on the risks and benefits that we have out there for those different options, I think is so important. So um, without further ado, we'll kind of dive into things here a little bit. And uh, the first thing, um, as Casey had mentioned, is, you know, my practice, um, I do operate out of Lankanal Hospital, uh, Paoli Hospital, and then also out of our uh, MOVE Center in Bryn Mawr, which is our outpatient joint replacement center. Um, I see patients at our uh, Malvern office, which is about five minutes down the road from our Paoli Hospital, and then uh, within Lankanal Medical Center right now. Uh, my practice, I do both anterior and posterior hip replacements for uh, total hips. Uh, each patient, I try to pick out what approach I think is going to be best for them. I think that it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all. Um, for total knee replacement, I do both partial and total knees. Um, with revision replacements, I do both hip and knee, and that takes on a multitude of factors, whether it be uh, fractures, infections, uh, instability, dislocations, um, wear of the components. Uh, so kind of all comers from the revision side as well. Um, and so when we look at this and we look at, you know, the outcomes after joint replacement surgery, the outcomes after joint replacement surgery are extremely good, right? When we look at hip replacement, 90 to 95% good to excellent outcomes. When we look at knee replacement, 80 to 85% good to excellent outcomes. And these are patient reported outcomes here. And so when you look at having one of these surgeries done, the vast majority of people are going to do extremely well and be very happy with their replacement but there's going to be people that fall into that category that are not thrilled with their replacement and some of those people are unfortunately ones that are going to have some form of a complication after their surgery doesn't mean they have a complication but some of them could right and those things we try to mitigate prior to surgery trying to say all right what can we do to try to give these people the best chance of having one of those good to excellent outcomes rather than falling in the other category uh, the pictures on the uh, right side of the screen are going to be uh, a picture of a hip replacement as well as a picture of a knee replacement, just in case people haven't seen those before, just kind of what the different parts would look like. Right. So when we look at some of these complications, and we kind of touched a little bit on this uh, already, talking about some of the revision things that I take care of, but there's a multitude of things that can happen, and this list is not all inclusive, but when we look at it, the risk for infection is there. Anytime we open up the body, there's a risk for infection, the risk for dislocation, or if after a hip replacement, the ball were to pop out of the cup, the risk for instability, more so in a knee replacement, where someone has potentially too much laxity to their ligaments, the risk for fracture, the risk for ligament injury, nerve injury, blood clots, pneumonias, bed sores, stiffness, persistent pain, heart attack, stroke, and even death, right? So you can see that while the risks are low, when we look at 90 to 95 and 80 to 85% outcomes after surgery, the chances of these things being a major effect on someone is definitely there. And so again, we wanna do things that are trying to minimize the chances of these. So timing, I say, is everything, right? Now, when we look at this, we want to make sure that we're having someone optimized for surgery. So joint replacement is a purely elective operation, meaning that no one needs to have the surgery. Are people good candidates for it? Absolutely. Can they have excellent outcomes? Absolutely. But if someone comes into my office and has a horribly arthritic joint and they say, I'm never getting my joint replaced, I tell them that's fine, right? They don't have to have the surgery. They can continue to go on and live about their days without getting a replacement, but we do know that arthritis is a progressive disease and that over time, someone's pain will increase and their function will decline. And so in most cases, people eventually will come around and say, okay, you know, even though I thought I was never going to do it, you know, I'm now ready to move forward with that surgery. And so when someone does make that uh, decision of being ready to move forward with joint replacement, we then want to make sure that we're doing it in a efficient manner that's going to help give them the best chance of that outcome. And so prior to surgery, we want to make sure that someone's blood pressure or cardiac issues are optimized. If they have a cardiologist, I want them to see that cardiologist. Sometimes people require stress tests, echoes, 
catheterizations, bypasses, all kinds of things to make sure that their heart is good for surgery. I want to make sure that someone's blood sugar is good for surgery. We know that if someone has a hemoglobin A1C greater than eight, that it's actually a hard stop, right? I have that red flag up there where we say, hold on, we have to get this better prior to surgery. Because if we don't, someone's going to have an increased risk for infection, right? Bacteria love sugar. And we know that if someone comes in with that elevated level, they're going to be at risk for having complications. If we look at someone's kidney function, we want to make sure that it's optimized, right? Some people have chronic kidney disease and that happens. And we want to make sure that someone's not having an acute on chronic failure from a kidney standpoint. Or if someone has such advanced kidney disease that they're on dialysis, we actually know that that's also a red flag where we say, listen, we have to get this better prior to surgery. Otherwise, the chances of having a poor outcome are extremely high. When we look at lung function, making sure that if someone has a pulmonologist or COPD or sleep apnea, yeah. that they, again, are going to be optimized prior to coming in and having that you know, plan in place. Um, from a weight standpoint, we look at height compared to weight, which gives us our BMI or our body mass index. And we know that if someone comes in with a BMI over 40, again, something that we need to stop and address prior to ensure good outcomes after surgery. And then another one is skin. And again, this list is not comprehensive, but skin is another one where if someone has open sores or lesions, that we want to make sure we seal those up prior to surgery so that we don't have an avenue for bacteria. And so when we look at all of these factors and we look at these red flags where we say, hey, why would we operate during these conditions when we know we can get them better? Most people would say, yes, that makes sense, right? I don't want to go into surgery with uncontrolled blood sugars or a heart that's higher risk for having a heart attack or my weight not being in an ideal position, right? But then we don't always think about after surgery and say, well, what things after surgery may increase my risk? for infection, for a complication, for a problem. And that's part of what tonight's talk is about, is to look at that other side of the coin and say, what can be done afterwards that can try to help optimize those outcomes? So if we look at the discharge after total joint replacement, it's a very common topic and a very common question that patients have. And it oftentimes produces a lot of anxiety and fear, right? People worry about how are they going to prepare meals after surgery? How are they going to bathe or shower after surgery? How will they simply get around inside their home? And are they allowed to do stairs, right? They may have a house that has multiple flights of stairs getting into the house and even once inside the house. And so all of these things can be very anxiety provoking beforehand. And years ago, we sent just about everybody to rehab facilities afterwards, whether they were inpatient rehabs or skilled nursing facilities. And the difference between between the two is simply the level of physical therapy that's involved in each of those centers. Uh, but ultimately, they're providing the same thing. They're a respite center for someone after joint replacement or after any hospital stay where they would go and have care tended to them. Um, and so while we did this years ago, there was actually no studies that showed that people had better outcomes going to these centers as compared to not. And so then we decided to look at that and say, all right, what if we study how these people do who go to these rehab facilities? And when we start to look at the data from what that shows us is that we have a study from 2017 that looked at the discharge to inpatient facilities afterwards and the morbidity or risk for complications afterwards. And this is a very large study following almost 55,000 patients after hip and knee replacement. And about 74, almost 75% went home and about 26% went to a skilled facility or an inpatient rehab. And when we look at the outcomes after that, it's fairly staggering how much of a disparity there is. So people who went directly to an inpatient facility, so both the inpatient rehab and the skilled nursing facility, were 34 times more likely to have an infection they were 51 times more likely to develop a urinary tract infection, 44 times more likely to be readmitted to the hospital, 31 times more likely to have a problem with their wound, and 93 times more likely to have a respiratory complication. And so you could see, based on all of these different risks, the risk that people had of a complication being in a center. And so while sometimes we may think about these inpatient rehabs as you know, what I need after surgery or what my insurance covers after surgery, so why wouldn't I go to this facility? Well, the proof starts here, right? The proof shows us that being in these centers 
does increase the risk of complications afterwards, right? Because not everybody in these centers just had their joint replaced, right? Not everybody's sitting there with their brand new hip or knee. You're having people that are next to you that just came out of the hospital with a pneumonia, with a bowel infection, you know, with a skin infection, some other issue. And so the risk for infection is going to be higher because people there, again, are going to carry different bacteria than what we naturally carry on our skin and in our home. We also know that the likelihood of us being up and moving around is going to be less less when we're in a facility as compared to when we're home. And again, sometimes this seems counterintuitive where people think I'm going to be going to this facility and getting up and, and doing so much physical therapy. How could I be doing more at home? But yet when we look at the breakdown of the day, similar to the hospital setting, you spend most of the time in bed. Physical therapy comes and gets you up and gets you moving around. But outside of that, you're in your room and in your bed and potentially sitting in the chair versus when you're at home, when you wake up in the morning to go from your bed to the living room or to the kitchen, you have to get up and walk that distance. And then after you finish your breakfast in the kitchen, you get up and walk to the living room. And when you have to go to the bathroom, you have to walk down the hall to go to the bathroom and back. And so all of these little movements are really crucial and key to optimizing our outcomes. Because as we see, movement is such an important part that we keep the body going, we keep our circulation flowing, it helps decrease the risk of blood clots, it helps decrease the risk of pneumonia, it helps decrease the risk of bed sores. So all of these factors come in from that added mobility. So, you know, it, it definitely is multifactorial. And again, sometimes the picture that may be painted in our minds or in our family's minds, you know, is that, you know, these rehab facilities are an acceleration of the rehab is actually going to be further from the truth. When we look at Another study done in 2015, this was from the Geriatric Orthopedic Surgery and Rehabilitation uh, Journal, and they reviewed actually 129,000 patients all in the state of Pennsylvania. And what they found was that people were, who were discharged to either an inpatient rehab or a skilled facility had a higher risk of readmission at 30 days after surgery. And the inpatient facility actually carried a higher risk, about an eight times higher risk, and the skilled nursing facility about a 1.3 times higher risk in this study. And when we look at the potential reasons for why an inpatient rehab versus a skilled nursing facility may carry a higher risk, can potentially be attributed to the nature of the aggressive therapy exercises that might be done in the early postoperative setting. And so years ago, again, we thought that aggressive therapy was exactly what we needed for all comers right out of the gate. And what we found is that actually sometimes less is more, right? While we want people up, we want them moving around, we want them doing motion to keep the body going and decrease those risks, we don't necessarily need to do a lot of strenuous physical training or exercise, working on building up muscle. In the early stages, those things can actually be detrimental and cause more pain, more swelling. And when we see more pain and more swelling, it may prompt someone to be concerned that they have a problem going on. And again, the potential for those facilities then to send someone back to the hospital to have that evaluated was demonstrated in both of these studies to see that. When we look at this paper, again, from the Journal of Arthroplasty, this one was a 10-year trend of independent risk factors for unplanned readmission following elective total joint replacement. And here we followed about 1,100 patients uh, after hip and knee replacement and found that the three independent risk factors that they found for readmission of the hospital was an increased body mass index, so again, that BMI number being elevated, an ASA score greater than three, and the ASA is a way that we look at uh, someone's overall health. So there's different markers that they get if they have certain medical issues, if they're well controlled, if they're not well controlled. And so if someone has more medical problems, that would increase their risk for a readmission. And then discharge to an inpatient rehab facility. And so when we looked at this, uh, there was about a 47% rate of readmission related to the surgical site. And that doesn't mean necessarily that they were having drainage from their surgical site or that they were having an active infection, but sometimes these readmissions to the hospital can simply be out of fear. And so when we see that there's more eyes on someone's incision or on their leg after surgery, it sometimes will prompt someone to have a feeling of fear about what that wound may look like. After surgery, I tell all my patients, you're going to be swollen. You're going to swell all the way down to your toes, 
and it's going to be normal. I tell them it's going to get more pronounced on day three, so day one and two, when they're in, you know, in there looking at their leg and they're saying, okay, it's not too bad, I'm not too worried about this. And then day three rolls around, which oftentimes happens to coincide with the weekend, and now their leg starts to balloon up, it goes all the way to the toes, and now they're starting to worry. But again, if they have that knowledge that this is normal, this is what to expect, you're going to have to spend some extra time with your leg elevated. You're going to have to do some icing to help with the increased discomfort that you may feel that those people will, again, know that it's normal and not be concerned. But if someone doesn't or someone in a facility sees that increase in swelling and says, this is abnormal, we need to rule out a blood clot, we need to rule out an infection, all of a sudden now, this person after the joint replacement, who may have no fears of themselves, are back in the hospital having an evaluation with ultrasounds and blood tests and workups that all may be completely unnecessary. So again, trying to improve the chances of a good outcome. When we look at this study uh, for home services, so you know, if we're not going to be going to inpatient rehabs or we're not going to be going to skilled facilities, are home services what we need? Because a lot of folks think, okay, I need somebody in my house if I'm not going to be taken care of in a facility. And when we look at this study, they looked at the ability to reduce the utilization of home visiting nurses after primary joint replacement. And they had about 509 patients that they reviewed. And actually during the study at the midway point, they ended up stopped doing visiting nurses altogether because they found that it was not producing any increased benefit to the patients. And in addition to the visiting nursing, they actually eliminated physical therapy in home for all total knees. And then they eliminated all physical therapy, both inpatient and outpatient for their total hips. And when they did this, they saw no increase in patients going to the rehab facilities and skilled nursing, no difference in the readmission risk with the patients who did not have these home care services versus those that did. And then no difference in complications or rates of reoperation. And so what we gleam from that is that the utilization of these home care services and these home nursings actually are not adding benefit to our overall outcome after joint replacement surgery. And so why is it that we don't necessarily need these home services anymore? And part of it is because we've changed the game in how we do our aftercare. Right? When we look at it previously, we put everybody on Coumadin after surgery to decrease the risk of getting a blood clot. And Coumadin required frequent blood draws, sometimes as often as every day in the early stages, and then on every three days after that. And these frequent lab draws were done by the nurses who were coming out to assess the patients. But now we utilize for the vast majority of patients a baby aspirin twice a day to minimize their risk of a clot in addition to that frequent ambulation in order to keep everything moving from the circulation side. And what we know from the data on that is that there's no increased risk of a clot with utilizing the baby aspirin versus using the Coumadin as long as we have people risk stratified. And so with that, we've been able to move away from those frequent blood draws. And even in folks that may be higher risk, now we oftentimes utilize other agents uh, if the aspirin is not going to be sufficient, given their risk factors, then we often will utilize Eliquis or Zorelto, which don't require those blood draws. The next thing is dressings. So historically, people had staples in their wounds, which led to significant drainage for prolonged periods of time. And this oftentimes required multiple dressing changes. Sometimes people needed other things to tend to that drainage. Sometimes people had drains in place. And now we've actually gotten away from those. So, you know, for all of my patients, their incisions are closed with dissolvable stitches that are underneath the skin. There's then a surgical glue over top of the wound that seals it. And that's what acts as the bandage. And so, you know, the ease and comfort of someone knowing this is what my incision looks like before they even leave the hospital. And they know that there's no bandage that they need to continually change and they're not going to expect to have any significant drainage really allows for a minimization of the care that's going to go into that. There's no creams or lotions on the scar for the first four weeks. You're allowed to shower, but you can't go underwater. So no pool, no bath, no hot tub for the first four weeks. But people are allowed to essentially otherwise act like the joint is normal from a skin standpoint, right? They can wear regular clothes. You know, they're allowed to shower and just pat it dry. So again, taking out some of that potential increased complexity that we had before with the utilization of staples. And then, as we mentioned earlier, you know, not doing complex physical therapy, right? So we're not doing aggressive exercises. We're not having people push on the limb right away after surgery, because again, this may produce more pain and swelling in a joint that's undergoing a big recovery, right? The surgery 
regardless is going to be an assault on the body, right? It's an attack where we go in and we change things and the body needs to recover after that. And I do talk a lot of times with people in the office about the example of spraining your ankle, right? If you, if you walk off the curb today and you sprain your ankle, no one's sending you to aggressive therapy that day, right? Or the next day, what they're going to do is they're going to say, rest it, ice it, elevate it, but make sure you keep moving your ankle so it doesn't get too stiff. Well, same thing after the hip or knee replacement, right? We don't need aggressive exercise. What we need is to rest, to ice, to elevate, and then to work on that range of motion for the knee where we keep things going from keeping it stiff. And then for the hip, simply being up and walking around again to prevent that stiffness. <clears throat> so what should you do post-op, right? So if we're not going to an inpatient rehab, if we're not going to a skilled facility, if we're not having home services, what are we supposed to do after surgery? And so the most important thing for afterwards is identifying a support person or people who are going to be able to help you after surgery. And this can be a friend, it can be a family member, it can be a neighbor, you know, any relative. Um, but you want to identify that person. You want to identify them early in the process because bringing them in to what to expect, to what's going to be needed is really important in my opinion. Um, there are some studies that look at people home after surgery by themselves. And while it is possible, again, having that person and that support system really, I think, makes the recovery easier. You know, joint replacement is a big deal. It's a big recovery. You know, the first couple of weeks, you're just getting over the operation. And so having someone there with you to help you through that process can make it easier. It's also sometimes a little bit of an isolating time those first few weeks after surgery. You're not driving right away. You're not sleeping well. You have pain and discomfort. And so a little bit of times people may feel blues or sadness or depression or things like that in the early set setting. And having somebody there with you to help talk about it and help you through the process and visit with you can be you know, changing for that. So I do think it's important to have that person. And then also having that person involved in what is actually going to go into the recovery. And so every patient that I see that's ready for surgery gets a booklet on hip and knee replacement so that they can prepare themselves for what to expect before, during, and after the operation. And it has all the commonly asked questions, all the do's and don'ts. What do I do about my incision? What do I do about icing? What do I do about elevation? When can I drive? You know, all those factors are all inside that booklet. And not only do I want the person who's having the surgery to read it, but I want their support person or team to read it as well, because the more knowledge, the more power, the better prepared we're going to be for this recovery. Some other things that people may want to do are to, you know, prepare for meals ahead, right? Preparing and freezing meals that are easy to heat up. Um, you know, we know when the surgery is going to be, again, in the elective sense, right? It doesn't just jump up and surprise you that, hey, you're having surgery tomorrow. You know, you know when this is happening. And so you can plan some of those things. You can remove loose rugs from around the house so you don't have increased tripping hazards. And then you want to plan to make life as easy as possible for the first two weeks. And what that means can be different for each individual and each individual setup. Someone may have no stairs in their home and someone may have dozens of stairs in their home. And if someone could have a one floor setup, is that gonna make life easier on, their, on themselves? Yes, right? Stairs are gonna be more physically taxing. And for most people, stairs are more taxing prior to surgery. <clears throat> but after surgery, again, it's gonna be more draining. And so if someone could set up a one floor setup, that's going to make it easier on them. Not everyone can. And, you know, with that understanding, we do actually practice with you on stairs before you leave the hospital to make sure that you're safe for that, you know, transition home and to be able to go up and down the stairs. I do recommend that people try to limit the stairs during the first one to two weeks to at least once a day, just again, to take it easy on the body and not overly tax their new joint replacement. When we look at uh, the you know old adage from uh, Winston Churchill um, that if we fail to plan, it's going to be planning to fail. And I do think that this is one that's really important because again, while we plan and we do all these things preoperatively, we don't want to miss the picture in the postoperative setting. You know, having that plan, having that confidence, knowing okay, this is going to be all right. We're going to make it through this. You know, we're going to have a, a little bit of a challenge during these first two weeks, but life will get better after that. Is very important. Um, so, you know, I think that having the discussions, you know, not only with your physician, but also with your family, you know, can be important because sometimes family may have a different view or different opinion of where you need to be after surgery. And, you know, without having the knowledge of, of what, you know, those risks are may lead to sometimes misguided uh, attempts at, you know, what may be best. Um, 
there are situations where skilled facilities or inpatient rehabs may be what's best for someone. Um, you have some people who <clears throat> come in and they already live in a skilled facility or an assisted facility where they are unable to take care of themselves. And they may not have people around them who you know, are able to be there. And so in those situations, right, someone may require the utilization of a skilled facility because they're already in one. In those instances, their day-to-day -day life is surrounded by other people who have other bacteria. So their quote unquote home environment is going to be coming from that. But when we see folks that are again coming from their own home and they have that ability to be up and around, you know, we see that the benefits are definitely there from a home setting as compared to an inpatient setting. Um, you know, I uh, I want to again thank everybody for taking the time to you know sit down and, and listen to the talk here tonight and we'll open it up for a QA. Uh, this is a little picture of, uh, of my family, my support system. Uh, my wife, Lena, who's a breast oncology surgeon um, in our mainline health system at both Bryn Mawr and Riddle. Uh, our oldest son, Calvin, who's five. Uh, our next, Christian, who just turned four in January. Carson, who's our two-year-old. And then uh, baby Colin, who's, uh, who's not as, as small as that now. He just turned one uh, this past Sunday. So uh, that's, that's my support system. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sizer. This was really good information <clears throat> um, for someone like me who sits in a lot of these presentations. This was a lot of new information I haven't heard before, so I appreciate you getting this out um, to the community so we can um, feed off of that. Um, one of the questions is, um, were those patients who were to who went to rehab facility more at risk patients anywhere? So therefore they were at higher risk for all those things anyways? So yeah, so it's a great, great question. And a lot of the studies, what they did was they actually looked at them as independent risk factors. So when they equalized for patients, body mass index, uh, ASA scores, you know, other medical problems, age, um, sex, um, race, all those factors, when they looked at it and they equalized it for all of those and said, all right, if everyone with the same ASA score you know, had their joint replaced, what were their odds? What were the odds? And so independently being in the rehab facility increased the risk, you know, outside of those other factors. So as an independent alone. Okay. <clears throat> um, next question. Um, next question. Are there any services covered under one's insurance to help someone with assistance for meal prep, laundry, driving to and from doctor's appointments, and maybe a little stability when they first go home? So everybody's insurances are different. Um, there, from my experience, there haven't been many insurances that cover um, that, that type of care. Um, most times if someone, you know, is looking for that type of extra hand, um, there are services that can be hired for it, um, but most times it is an out-of-pocket expense rather than an insurance covered. Um, I've had a few patients who, uh, you know, have, have randomly had, you know, services where people come in and, and do those type of things, but very infrequent have I come across that. Okay. Um, is the booklet that you referenced you, unique to us here at Rothman, or is that the hospital? So the hospital does have information that they uh, provide when people are, you know, coming in for the surgery. Um, the booklet that I referenced is one that um, I've actually gone through and made, and so you know I've gone and kind of cultivated all of those commonly asked questions. A lot of the physicians at Rothman have similar books. Um, people may do things differently in terms of, you know, when do they shower, when do they do things like that. So there can be differences in what each surgeon may do uh, to a small degree. Um, but, uh, but the book is, is, from my practice, is kind of the way that I do it. So it's, it's individualized for my patients for me. Okay. And at what point during, um, do you receive that, that booklet at, um, with the surgical scheduler? At, or at what point do you receive that book? Yeah, so usually, you know, in the office, you know, we sit down, we're talking about things, and if someone decides that, you know, they're ready, you know, to move forward with surgery, and we we set a surgical date, um, usually either my clinical assistant, Megan, when she comes in uh, with the paperwork, will have the booklet, or Michelle, uh, or Amanda, or my schedulers um, would give them the booklet in order to, you know, kind of have them read through it. Usually it's Megan, um, but occasionally it'll be our surgical schedulers as well. Okay. 
Um, what is the outpatient rehab like for two to four weeks after knee surgery? So for the first two weeks after knee surgery, uh, there's two exercises that I have in the booklet. Um, one is a bending exercise and one is a straightening exercise. Uh, the only thing you need to be able to do it is a chair and then for you to sit in and then a, another chair, a stool, an ottoman, something for you to be able to put your leg up on when doing the straightening exercise. Um, it's, it's very basic. It's very simple. It doesn't require weights or pulleys or anything like that during those first two weeks. And, you know, the goal is to just work on slowly increasing that motion. Um, I want someone during those first two weeks to push their own pain thresholds. Um, when you have someone pushing you potentially where your body's past ready, uh, it can sometimes increase that pain, that swelling response. Um, so I like people to do those exercises and, you know, I want them to do it as often as possible, right? I say minimum five times a day. But if they can do it more, even better, right? It's, you know, it's a little bit of that um, squeaky wheel where, you know, if you keep it moving, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay better. And so the longer someone sits inactive, the more those tissues are going to want to tighten up and stiffen up. So, you know, keeping the knee moving during those first two weeks. When I see people back in the office after the first two-week period, I check where their motion's at. And based on where they are, determines, all right, where we go from here. Do we continue with the home exercises or do we start formal outpatient physical therapy? And so if someone has 90 degrees or more of motion, we talk about, you know, their, their hopes, their desires, their goals. Um, if someone is less than 90 degrees, I say they have to get started in physical therapy. You know, that's where we got to you know, kind of push them to say, all right, you know, we've given them those two weeks to let the tissues calm down. Now we need to really start to, to advance things to make sure that they, you know, stay on course. Great. Um, do you support outpatient physical therapy? So from, yeah, from the knee side, again, you know, after that first two week interval, um, we look at where they are and the potential of doing outpatient physical therapy. For hips, what we find is that physical therapy really tends to increase the pain and discomfort and actually slow the recovery. So I typically, I would say 90 plus percent of my patients after hip replacement do not do any formal physical therapy. Uh, it's simply walking at six weeks, they can start to add back in exercise for exercise sake. So if they wanted to start getting on a bicycle and, and riding an exercise bike or getting on the treadmill and walking longer distances or the elliptical or swimming in a pool, you know, all of those things at six weeks they can start to do. Um, but again, 90 plus percent don't require any formal therapy after the hip. Great. How long after surgery do you do a follow-up visit? So for knees, it's usually around two weeks. It often ends up just because of surgical timing being like around probably two and a half weeks or three, um, but somewhere in that two week time frame. Um, for knees, it's usually around four weeks, or for hips, I'm sorry, it's usually around four weeks when I see people back. Um, let's see, there's a few personal ones. I wanna get through some general questions first. Um, what are your thoughts on knee manipulation as I am seven years out and do not have the desired flexibility in addition to stiffness and pain? So when we look at manipulation uh, after total knee replacement, uh, the optimal timing for a manipulation uh, is around tw before 12 weeks. After 12 weeks, the risk of having a crack or break in the bone or a tearing of our tendons rather than the scar tissue is significantly higher. Um, so when we're looking at someone who's struggling post-operatively to get their motion back, you know, they had the few weeks to work on their own motion. They then worked with physical therapy. They're really not getting past, you know, where we need them to get. And functionally, they're struggling because of that is when we would look at a manipulation. And going back when that tissue is still in the immature state gives you the best chance to break up those adhesions and then have the person try to, you know, restart the process of pushing past, you know, those pain thresholds. Um, sometimes we'll see that where, you know, someone maybe had a history of addiction to medicine in the past or a family member had an addiction to pain medicine. So someone tries to go, you know, without taking anything and, you know, they get through those first two weeks and they come back in and say, hey, doc, I did great. I took none of that pain medicine. You know, isn't that wonderful? And I say, that's great. Let's check your motion. And they say, oh, no, I can't move it. It hurts too much, right? You know, those people kind of miss the, the importance of that motion aspect to it. And sometimes if they fall behind there, getting that scar tissue broken up with manipulation can help them. Um, but at seven years, the risk, you know, with doing a manipulation is you're, you're more likely to break the bone 
or tear a tendon. Um, so really manipulation wouldn't be a, a viable option in my opinion. Okay. Are there any particular patient characteristics that would make you choose for them to go to an outpatient facility over going home? Um, so again, as we had talked about, you know, in, in the lecture that if someone's coming from, you know, a facility where they already are requiring, you know, levels of care, um, demonstrating that they're unable to care for themselves at baseline, um, those people may be individuals that would require being in a facility afterwards because they're in a facility prior. Um, but in my opinion, you know, if we have somebody that's home, you know, again, uh, people have been living with their arthritic joints where they're painful, they struggle to move around, they're using a cane, they're using a walker, you know, they have these limitations, but they've been able to get through their days and make their meals and go up and down the stairs and get dressed. And, you know, after surgery, while it is a big physical toll on the body, they now have a joint that no longer has arthritis to it, right? They now oftentimes have more of a stable feeling to that joint. Um, so the ability to be in the home setting is sometimes less um, cumbersome than potentially what they envisioned um, from a preoperative setting. Um, uh, there's a lot of details in this question, but I'll get to the last question part of it. And it says, can I use or can I request a catheter to be used um, during surgery and then kept in two days post-surgery if I got a joint replacement? So catheters were something that historically we utilized, you know, go back about 15 years and everybody who came in to get a joint replacement had a catheter that was placed. Um, and similar to a lot of what we've seen throughout the last 15 years has been, you know, the, the less invasive we are, the better it is for outcomes. So placing a catheter does increase the risk for urinary tract infection does increase the risk for a joint infection. You know, if we have infections elsewhere in the body, so really not advisable to use um, a catheter in the post-operative setting. Um, so, you know, instead, if someone has issues, you know, with incontinence, if someone has issues, um, you know, from a, a bladder leakage side, you know, wearing it depends um, or things like that are actually going to be much more beneficial uh, to minimizing that risk rather than placing a catheter. You know, if someone develops post-op urinary retention where they're unable to avoid, that's the risk benefit to doing a straight catheterization where we actually just catheterize the bladder to drain it and then remove the catheter immediately afterwards is sometimes needed more often in men um, than women just because of the prostate issues that we see in men, um, but not not advisable for uh, routine catheter placement and, you know, to have it maintained for days afterwards again would be ill advised. Um, you do still have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try keep them short and quick. Um, you didn't mention anything about functional outcomes of patients who received or didn't receive physical therapy service. Are there similar, um, are they similar, better, worse? So yeah, so when we look at the outcomes uh, with patients who um, have physical therapy, whether it's um, in home, just doing exercises themselves versus going to outpatient physical therapy. Um, studies have actually shown us no difference in terms of outcomes, uh, whether it be range of motion, function, pain scores um, from a long term functional standpoint. So, no difference in terms of outcomes. Okay. How do you feel about physical therapy to prepare for surgery? So, prehab, when we look at um, a overall perspective, um, the data would tell us that prehab doesn't necessarily change outcomes afterwards. Um, I think that that takes in, you know, the all comers. And when people ask me about that in the office, I really ask them about what their preoperative function is. And so if you see someone who is motivated, who while they have an arthritic joint, they get themselves up still, they get moving, you know, they're not just sitting on the couch every day, you know, they may still find some form of activity that they're able to do that their knee or hip tolerates. I think that those people don't necessarily benefit from that prehab. Um, when we look at someone who maybe is less motivated, who, you know, says, well, I'm probably not going to get up and I'm probably not going to move around, you know, unless I have that accountability for it. Um, those folks may benefit from, you know, seeing that uh, increase in their muscle strength prior to surgery with going to some prehab um, is, is kind of where I look at it as, as, you know, what does that person do on a normal day-to-day -day basis prior to surgery to get themselves ready? 
Do you still offer bilateral knee replacements simultaneously, same day, and would you send them home post-op if so? So very infrequently would I do bilateral simultaneous knee replacements. Um, when we look at the outcomes afterwards, again, we see that there's an increased risk of complications and problems with simultaneous bilateral. Um, occasionally, I will if someone has a significant uh, preoperative valgus or varus alignment to the point that if I fixed one of the limbs, they wouldn't be able to walk correctly because their, their alignment would have been so off from the other side. Um, but it's pretty infrequent to see someone have that severe of a degree of, of a contracture. Um, the uh, thinking previous was that if we had our younger, healthier patient population, that doing bilateral simultaneous would be less of a risk as compared to our older or more sickly population. And it turns out it's not true. Even our youngest and healthiest patients, if you do bilateral simultaneous, do have an increased risk for complications. Um, how long after surgery would you expect swelling in the lower leg and foot after knee replacement? Yeah, so afterwards, they've done studies to look at this, um, and the data tells us about six months that you can have increased swelling in the operative side compared to the contralateral side. And then the same goes for warmth. Um, you know, sometimes people after their knee replacement may feel it and say, you know, it feels warm or hot to the touch. Um, when they've done skin temperature probe testing, again, about six months that that temperature can be elevated compared to the opposite side. Um, all right, the next few are, right, are, few are a bit more are, personal, so we'll try and go through these quick. Um, when does sleep become comfortable again after total knee replacement? So it's usually around six weeks um, for most patients. There are some lucky ones that, you know, at two weeks they're saying, oh, I'm sleeping through the night. It is very surprising. Most people note that every one to two hours they're getting up. They're changing positions. They may get the ice pack on the knee. They may get up and walk around. They may go sit in the chair for a little while. So very common for sleep to be disrupted during this first six weeks. Um, we've tried a lot of things over the years to see how we could correct that. Um, we've tried melatonin. We've tried Benadryls, Tylenol PMs, um, you know, different sleep aids, things like that. And nothing really has been able to move the needle tremendously on that. Um, so they're all things that, you know, people could try afterwards. Uh, but for most patients, it's just tincture of time that helps them start sleeping better. Um, there are some that are on that opposite end of the lucky spectrum uh, where, you know, after six weeks, they're still not sleeping through the night. And it could take them longer, some people even up to 12 weeks. Uh, one just came in. Are any of your opinions about rehab services based on the now shared reimbursement from re insurance between surgery centers, hospital surgeons, and or rehab therapy facilities? Yeah, so it's a great question. And a lot of people come and, and think that, right? And again, they say, you know, my insurance covers these services. You know, why is this being withheld from me? And they think that it's it's a financial reason for why to do it. But everything that I've shown you here from a data standpoint, right, is showing you that these things increase our risk of complications, right? It has nothing to do with the financial side. Now, when we look at bundled payments and we say, all right, you know, are there things that would increase the reimbursement of doing an operation, you know, to change? The answer to that would be yes, right? There can be benefits to doing that. But if you were going to send someone to a facility that would decrease the reimbursement and increase their risk of a complication, Right. That that wouldn't make any sense at all. Right. So, again, you know, the, the data that I've shown you here tonight is purely based on outcomes, um, you know, following, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of patients. Um, and so, you know, that's that's what we rely on is, you know, following evidence based medicine. Great. The last two questions are actually similar. Um, they a couple years ago, one did a knee replacement, one did a hip replacement, um, and one specifically says they did not go to Rothman, but <laughs> they are still in pain. Any suggestions on what they can do today? So when we look at pain after joint replacement surgery, it's one of the more complicated factors uh, because now you have that artificial prosthesis in there. And while that prosthesis can't feel pain, right, it's metal and plastic. 
um, so it doesn't have that ability to, to sense, our soft tissues all around it can. Um, and so there can be a number of reasons as to why, you know, it could be that, you know, do they have subtle instability to their knee? Do they have scar tissue that has contracted the knee and now doesn't let it move naturally? Um, do they have, you know, irritation of the tissues from the implant? So there, there definitely can be reasons that could uh, precipitate out pain after joint replacement. There are some people that we look at, and when we look at the outcomes, that first slide that I showed you of patient reported outcomes um, after HIP, that 90 to 95%, in physician reported outcomes, um, the HIP is still 90 to 95%, but patient is 90 to 95% for physician and only about 80 85% for patients. And so there is a disconnect where sometimes we'll see a knee replacement that looks perfect, that has excellent motion, that has excellent stability to it, and the person still doesn't feel well. They still don't like their joint replacement. They're not happy with it. And there isn't always an easy explanation for why. And sometimes it's a tincture of time to figure out why. You know, someone may have a joint that has microscopic loosening to it, and the x-rays look well, and it moves well, and everything appears perfect. But over time, that microscopic loosening could become macroscopic, where it shows itself. Um, but, but definitely a, a challenging thing to, to look at. And, you know, sometimes it does. It needs another set of eyes on it. Sometimes it needs, you know, another set of eyes over a prolonged period of time. Um, <clears throat> last question just came in. Um, and then we'll, we'll go, but, uh, how does walking fit in with post-operative treatment for total knee replacement? Yeah. So walking again, just like after the hip, it's going to be very important to do. However, those first two weeks, whether it's hip or knee, it's not trying to walk through the recovery, meaning that you can't speed this along by trying to just walk and walk and walk. And if you're trying to push through the pain from walking, you're going to likely set yourself back. So I say during those first two weeks, you want to do short, frequent walks, meaning going from the kitchen to the living room and the living room to the dining room and to the bathroom and back to the front door. And, you know, all of those little distances, which will add up to a whole lot over the course of the day. Um, there's been some studies that have shown, you know, five to 10 steps every hour will help to decrease the risk of having a blood clot. And so if you look at that, right, that's not a whole lot of movement that's required, but it does require movement. And so, you know, every hour having somebody up and moving while they're awake, right, they don't need to set alarms and wake themselves up because naturally our bodies are supposed to rest. Um, but while you're, while you're awake, getting up and moving around. And then after those first two weeks, we start to increase that distance. And at that stage, you really let your body be your guide. Meaning that if someone goes and they do two laps around the kitchen table and then back to the living room and they feel well, great. But if they do those same two laps and their joint says, oh, you know what, that was a little too much. All right, that's not where their body's ready for, right? They wanna dial that back and wait until their body's ready to do that distance. Meaning that stay at one lap around the kitchen table and then a few days later, try again to go up to two. And if it feels better at that stage, you know, now you're at two and then three and then working to outside and down the driveway and now down the block and around the block and really just building on that process and each day, each week getting stronger and getting better. Great. I'm going to squeeze one more question. And am I likely to need a cane or any other device after hip surgery? So part of that can depend on how someone comes into surgery. Um, so, you know, if someone's been wheelchair dependent for, you know, a number of years prior to coming in because they didn't want to have their joint replaced, but now they're at that stage, it's going to take much more for that patient to get back to being fully ambulating without the utilization of any assisted device, simply because of the deconditioning that their body's going to have undergone. Um, we can also have patients who may have other soft tissue issues, or they may have spinal issues or neurologic issues that could, you know, precipitate out the need to utilize a cane or a walker after surgery. Um, but the vast, vast majority of patients after joint replacement surgery do not require an assistive device, um, even if they were using it prior simply for the arthritic joint, right, not for another process. If they just had, you know, increasing levels of pain that required them to use a cane or walker, the vast majority of those people do get off of it. Great. Uh, Dr. Sizer, I really appreciate you joining all of us tonight and everyone out there. Thank you. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I will be sending this recording out to everybody um, within the next week, probably. Um, but just to remind everyone, 
Dr. Sizer sees patients out of the Malvern and Lincoln office. And if you would like to schedule an appointment with him, his phone number, the VIP line is 610-480-6584. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Casey. Thank you.